Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Hey, thanks for joining us for this edition of Donnybrook. Great to have you with us. And on the second half, a program we call Next Up, Wendy and I will talk to Maxine Clark, the founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop, and now someone who's leading a major development on Del Mar Boulevard, just east of Sk Skinker. It's called the Del Mar Divine. And we'll talk about that and other issues. But first, let's welcome back Wendy Weiss, the news director for the Big 550 KTRS and the co-host of the Jennifer and Wendy Show. We also welcome back from his week off, Mr. Bill McClellan from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He's Ray Hartman from RawStory.com, the World Front Times, and his own program, Evenings on the Big 550. We also welcome the news editor for the St. Louis American and a sports columnist there as well, Mr. Alvin Reed. We're going to start with you, Wendy, because we have news. Judge Ellen Nelly Robato ruled that there won't be a mask mandate, whatever you call it. She enjoined the mask mandate, which was preferred by the St. Louis County Executive, but then the state's attorney general, as well as the county council, rejected it. It went to court. There was no compromise. And so now in St. Louis County, uh, I guess you don't have to wear a mask in public places or on public transportation or whatever the rule is. Let me ask you this. A lot of people want one of the masks as we live with the Delta variant. Um, who do you blame for this not being in effect? Well, I, I think that if County Executive Page had not acted unilaterally to begin with, if he had worked with the County Council and you know, done the work that has to be done legislatively in that session, uh, showing each and every one of them who represents their own constituency uh, the same kind of respect that he seems to demand from everybody. I don't think that, that we would be here. What is really interesting, though, is judge, according to Judge Roboto's order, if anyone, if anyone would even think of stepping outside of this in, injunction, um, then they will now be criminally liable. So uh, I think we just we all need to kind of watch for that in in the days ahead because this is now a pretty fiery issue. But I I, I blame Sam Page for acting like a king instead of a a, a coalition builder. I think there's plenty of blame to go around, frankly. I, this is a horrible situation for a basically blue county. In, in a, this is obviously a red-blue issue nationally. We're certainly not the only ones fighting about this. But the outcome is so awful. I feel like kind of blaming everybody except the judge, who sounded more like a kindergarten teacher trying to get people to come to, you know, kids to play nice. Uh, I don't think it was her fault. They couldn't. The parties were just so locked in to their, their talking points, whatever they were, that there was no compromise. Um, all I know is it's a really bad outcome because this, uh, the Delta variant and the pandemic are not hypothetical and they're not really political. This is a serious health crisis. And it's just frankly disgusting that any of us, Republican, Democrat, whatever, should have our lives jeopardized by this, this dysfunction. Well, I, I thought it was quaint and kind of old school, uh, young Judge Nelly Rabaldo trying to use moral persuasion in, in an issue where there was just, uh, there's, there's no moral, she, she needed a club. Like I can remember uh, Judge Brendan Ryan having a divorce case and thinking that the, the, the two, the husband and wife didn't have much money and he was upset with the lawyers for making it so contested. And he said, I want you to settle this. And they said, can't be settled. And he was in the chamber and he said, okay, well, we'll be out there in 10 minutes to start. I'm blocking off two days. And the first thing I'm going to announce is we're waiving legal fees. See you in 10 minutes. And in five minutes, they, the lawyers came back in and said, we've settled. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and the poor Judge Roboto didn't have that kind of leverage. All she could do was, like you say, Ray, see, play nice. And it's just these... People are well beyond that. 
No, well, and I was going to say that too, that her, what she was asking people to do, it was beyond that. But why? Because you had two council women from North County, council women uh, Days, who's the chair, and council women Webb voting against the best interest of their people for political reasons. Listen, there are rattlesnakes out there, okay, and more of them, for whatever reason, are in your precincts or in your districts that you represent than other places throughout St. Louis County. Now, whatever problems you have with Sam Page and whatever you problems with you have with how he did things or whatever problems you have, you voted with individuals that A, have proven to not really care about this entire pandemic and two definitely don't care about the people that you represent so i blame them you could have look the judge can rule however she wants to but the reason that it got to this point so fast and so ridiculously out of control at the council meetings rest on both of their heads i i disagree elvin i'll tell you why uh i was surprised when shalanda webb didn't vote for a mask mandate because she sent out a press release, which we all received a couple of weeks ago, saying that she was in favor of a mask mandate. She just didn't want the method used by the county executive to enact it. But I blame those who didn't get vaccinations. I'm not going to blame the leaders in this case. The reason we're in this situation during the Delta variant that it's spreading and people are filling the hospitals with a nursing labor shortage is because too many of us did not get the vaccination. We shouldn't even be talking about masks at this stage of the game. I mean, okay. I agree with you. I agree with you. That's where we're at, okay? And I will say that building a $50 million facility in North County, which wouldn't be completed for five years, where there would be herd immunity or we'll all be dead, that's ridiculous. I I just like, come on, let's be realistic about the situation right now. And it's proven hmm. that masks help reduce the spread of the coronavirus. So anybody who stands against that for any reason is in the wrong. Okay, um, let's move on to you, Ray Hartman. Um, after rather during one of the county council meetings recently. Um, speaker after speaker got up and shared their views on masks, pro and con. As it turns out, many of them were against masks. But some of them used language that upset Rabbi Susan Telvey, as well as former state lawmaker Stacy Newman. According to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the speaker said things like, this, meaning St. Louis County, feels more like Nazi Germany, not America, land of the free. Another speaker alluded to the Holocaust while denying the existence of COVID-19. There is no virus. It's a scam. What did the Nazis say? And at least two other speakers, according to the Post, falsely claimed the COVID-19 vaccines were experimental and a violation of the Nuremberg Code, which, of course, had connections to actions committed by the Nazis on Jewish prisoners at Auschwitz. Okay. Uh, both S Sam Page, Stacy Newman, Rabbi Talvey, and others say that the chair, uh, the chair of the council, rid of her days, owes the Jewish community an apology and should have shut down these speakers, and the speakers were, de were decried for their anti-Semitism. Seems to me that their remarks were ignorant and insensitive, but they also seem to be constitutionally protected speech. What do you say? Well, I think it's great that Rabbi Talvey and, and Stacy raised this awareness in the community about just how obscene and stupid this was. I don't agree that the uh, responsibility falls at all with with Councilwoman, uh, Council Chairwoman uh, Days. Um, I, I've said it on the air. My grandparents were murdered at Auschwitz, so I have a connection to this story. I find it. I don't even use the word offensive, though. It's so stupid. And my view is I'd rather know where the stupid people are. I'd rather know where the Nazis are. Not these people, but, but in general, um, I happen to believe that as a practical matter, the more moronic these people are and are allowed to be i'm just not somebody who believes in bleeping them out I, I i will say this and i don't want to get off the subject too much but they spend way 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 too much time tolerating these ridiculous comments generally they don't need to set two hours there's a million of us in st louis county we don't all have a right to speak at the next council meeting they should limit this i think 
I think their rules say an hour. I think they ought to live, live, limit the public comment uh, up for, to maybe 30 minutes. And good for Kelly Dunaway that she suggested, it was voted down 5-2, that they allow people to make their comments virtually because there's a lot of us that might want to comment that don't feel like risking their lives going to a maskless meeting uh, to okay. do Okay. So. All right. But okay. Key words weren't left out. Well, you're making that argument. Okay, and I'll put this to, to, to chair days, all right? If these people had said, I feel like a Jewish person in Auschwitz, what does that say, all right? If they said to Rita Days, I feel like a, a Negro in Alabama during slavery, she'd have been banging that gavel till the, till the deist fell down. See, <laughs> don't let this stuff pass. This stuff is racist. It's it's anti-Semite. It's out of control, and don't give people a pass because. But, but no, 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 no. See, I, I and I'm sorry to interrupt, Alvin. I just disagree so strongly. I don't think they're even smart enough to realize. I don't think. I think they think that they 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 actually put themselves on the same level as Jews during the Holocaust. To, to to equate being asked to wear a mask or to get a vaccine with the extinction, with the extermination of a, an entire people, of an entire part of the world, that is that is a level of stupidity that we, I, I don't think they, they're trying to be anti, I don't think they're trying wait, to be wait, anti wait, anything. Wait, I think they're wait, so stupid. Wait. It's not Rita Days' obligation to educate these people about the the nonsensical thing that they're saying. But brilliance didn't create the Holocaust, and brilliance didn't protect slavery in the United States of America. Stupidity and racism cause these things. And but, you have to, like, target it and say, like, I'm not allowing that. I am standing up and saying, like, you might have the right to say anything you want, but you're not saying it in this council chamber. Well, right but it, it, it's a... It's a government meeting you know and well, these people no, no, have the I, freedom of speech do they not Ray? well i you know ernie trachis was throwing that phrase around and i think it's we ought to spend some money sending him some continuing legal education so he understands the meaning of freedom of speech i mean technically in a forum like that government shouldn't be regulating content but and I understand, I respect what Alvin's saying, because I understand your point. Your analogy is a good one. If it, it, it changed the words, it might have been a different response. Um, and I'm not minimizing, as I say, good for Stacy and, and, and Rabbi Talby for bringing it up. I just think w one of the things, had Rita cut them off, then the big story would have been how Rita cut them off. And that would have right. given more publicity. And my point is, it's amazing that we have these people living among us in St. Louis County, but I still would rather know that they're out there. But you understand it's that this is this is national, this is global. People right. all it's, over it, the it globe is, are making this argument, though. saying that, these, that, that they are being treated like Jews during the Holocaust. Right, right. And I, 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 I respect what Wendy was saying, and I, I like... Uh, Rabbi Talvi and uh, former legislator Stacey Newman, but I, I don't think this was really, they were, the speakers really thought of themselves as being anti-Semitic. And I think when you, and, and, and the anti-Semitism, like racism, is a real scourge. And I think when you use that term too loosely, it's not a good thing. Okay, okay. Alvin, let's, let's move on. Wait, wait, wait real the, quick story. In, in, in this, this week, this week, in discussing Cory Bush, somebody said to me, this happened two days ago, said, like, well, explain it to me, your color, okay? Now, this happened in Kirkwood, Missouri, two days ago. Now, I don't think he, whatever, I could excuse it for not being racist, but, hey, that's out of control, okay? And if you let this stuff go, it gets even further out of control. Well, you know, Elvin, the government is not supposed to control the content of our speech. That's why we have freedom of speech, to allow speech that we disagree with, right? But that's not now. quite the, they're, they're, okay. I, one right. of the things, can I let, tell let, you a solution? No, let, let's not have another story because we have uh, lots of topics part. here, okay. including Elvin Reed. We know that there have been uh, many problems in Afghanistan with the way that the Biden administration has been winding down that war. But uh, among the issues we will be facing, refugees in the United States. St. Louis City has about 60,000 
Bosnian refugees that came here in the mid-1990s, according to some estimates. Local leaders have said in the city and the county they're, well, they're ready to welcome about 1,000 Afghan refugees to St. Louis. I think that's far too low a number, especially since we have so many job openings right now that aren't filled. I think we should bring 10 to 20,000. What say you, Alvin? I say bring 30,000 Haitians here. Okay, what do you say to that? Oh, no. Come no, I'm in now. favor of that, too. Right. I said no. that the other day on KMOX. I, I think that the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, should welcome all that come. Give us your tired, your hungry, your poor. With that said, we have problems here. We have problems, which we're discussing right now, with minorities and inclusion and diversity and how people think of other people. Um, can we prioritize what we have here right now before we move on to bring in another 20,000 people to our region. It's not wrong, but let's not lose track of, of what our real problem is. And we got real problems in this, in this region right now. Of course, the, the idea, Alvin, is that immigration helps the city and helps the region and a stronger city and stronger region would help the people who are already here and, and need help. I mean, uh, otherwise, your point is good. We sure have a lot of uh, homegrown problems. If 20,000, you know, Afghans came to St. Louis, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just going to state this what I think. Ultimately, I think the price to be paid would be paid by residents of the city of St. Louis, by which the majority of those are black. I don't think there would be a price to be paid, personally. I, I understand what you're saying. If we want to wait till we fought, we, we wouldn't be accepting anybody if we wait till we fix things here. Um, I think you have an That's issue. That's a good point. point. That's a good point, Ray. That no, is no, I mean, I, and my point is, I think your, your, your heart's in the right place. And I think there are, you've got to consider that there are lots of multiple folks that are affected. One of the interesting things, it was just flat out wonderful that Bosnian Muslims came in great numbers to this community some years ago. But the city of St. Louis wasn't able to retain that community in the city. And I think there's some questions to be raised. We got a wonderful international institute, but there's some real questions to be raised about to your point, Alvin, if we're going to accept people, which I am in favor, whether the Haitians are, you know, I agree. Afghans. And I love the fact that the Republicans who like all of a sudden are whining about how terrible it is that we abandoned these poor Afghanistan refugees uh, and translators and stuff. They don't want them here. A lot well, I don't know if that's true, Ray, because I, I saw like Charlie some Baker Republican governor, some Look, Republican governor. The, the fact is. Uh, Anheuser Bush was started by immigrants. Shaw's Garden. Uh, right. Henry Shaw was an immigrant. That's right. What color were they? Uh, Charlie. Charlie. Express what? Scripts was Charlie. started by the son of a Mexican and, immigrant. Uh, okay, but Charlie, and these immigrants what, what would fill the jobs that we okay. currently have open. Fox C6, school district is looking for until, bus drivers. Alvin, Metro is looking until, for drivers. The list goes on and on. until we take care of, of, of all of the problems we have now before we let additional people in sounds an awful lot like the 45th president. I I'm for letting them in, let's be clear. I'm not saying that. I just think we have to have a strategy to help people become, you know, comfortable and... Uh, and to help like, all uh, people, to help all people. Right. Correct, correct. And I, th I think there's room for growth because we had the census last week. We're a dying city. We used to be a top 20, now we're 21. Immigration is one thing we lack in. Hey, uh, Bill McClellan, the jail... Lost control again. Last weekend for five hours, the guards watched while one detainee after another beat up on three of them, sending them to the hospital. This is not the first time. It's like the seventh disturbance. Then the detainees left their rec area where they were, I guess, exercising at 1130 at night. And then they destroyed the control panel and the computers and more. And then finally, five hours later, the sheriff's department, along with uh, some uniform members of the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, showed up. Guards are saying they don't have enough masks, they don't have enough guards. I think that we've gotten to a point where local control is not working at this jail, so either fill up the medium security workhouse or move these people to state and federal facilities. What do you say? Well, first of all, I was against closing the workhouse. I thought that was done uh, too prematurely. But I, I think what we ought to do is what most cities do. You put the sheriff in charge of the jail. At least then there's somebody accountable. I mean, I, I never know who's accountable 
for for the jail. I mean, it, we had Dan Isom, who's the director of public safety, on the show, and I thought Dan Isom was in charge. All of a sudden, there's another outbreak, and they push some major I've never heard of in in front of the cameras, and the majors didn't seem to know what she was talking about. It's, it just if if we had the sheriff in charge, at least if if there was a failure, we would say it's on Sheriff Betts. Instead of right now, we don't know who's in charge. I don't anyway. And the videotape that that KMOV w obtained, th the thing that's so surprising to me is you know that the that the guards have to feel intense heat right now with all of the coverage in the media about what is going on at the Justice Center. But there's still this apparent apathy I, I, it's, it's just hard. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to wrap your head around it. I, 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 I can't imagine. The bills. Well, I, I think ahead. some projects that you have, you, you just have a problem putting a, a financial figure, a dollar amount on what it fix, what it takes to fix the, that project. And I don't think that's one of these. Okay. We need to move everybody in this facility someplace else for a month, six weeks. And we need to completely get this place ready to hold prisoners, all right? And that's what we're going to do. It doesn't seem that difficult to me. And if the, the mayor needs to use the money coming to the city, um, you know, through the ARA, well, then do that. If there's some other grants or whatever, then, then, then do that. But I just think there's this hesitancy, that, which I can't understand, to just address the problem and fix it. And that's the that's the that's the point I don't get. Well, you make a great point, Alvin. And when you say we need to fix the jail so it can hold prisoners, I mean it just seems like that should have been self-evident already. <laughs> yeah. That would be a good thing to do with the jail. I like to, able to I fix like to, hold prisoners. I would like to disagree with all your solutions on the grounds that um, I don't have a clue, and I don't think any of us from afar can. I was talking to somebody, you know, certainly way smarter than me, who's in this business and it doesn't sound like i mean it, as for the for those of us like for us looking at this thinking you have jail cells that don't lock you know it seems so bizarre and so irrational but you it's fact and it, well yeah but the fact is i'm sorry with all respect to sheriff Betts, there's nothing he can do about that and and it's apparently there's all kinds of at, at least we know who's in charge right who, who, who he, he wouldn't be in charge bill who, who, who is, is who is responsible right now is it dan isom i i know i don't know it's a problem the that we're not going to have an answer would be but can i say one thing though charlie uh lord uh um Breger. Breger. Uh, and, and KMOV, that was a really good story for them. And we don't, they get a shout out for that because we've had a lot of stories we've seen. Uh, you know, here, here. Just, it was a good story for them. Ray, I want to ask you something because it's uh, tragic in the minds of some. Uh, Steve Walsh, the husband of Sarah Walsh, a state lawmaker, she is uh, running for the seat that Vicki Hartzler is going to give up in Congress if she tries to become the next senator. Uh, Steve Walsh has died. Uh, after suffering from COVID-19, he was quite public about the fact that he was not vaccinated. She's not vaccinated either. I guess I'm a little bit judgy. I uh, have a limit, I guess, in terms of empathy. I I'm not feeling sorry for people who take up hospital beds because of their COVID-19 after they are openly unvaccinated. How about you? I don't agree with you. I and I I did not know uh, Steve Walsh, but I have a number of friends who knew him well. Said so he's a good guy, and I mean, obviously, I disagree with his politics strenuously, uh, and with Sarah Walsh's politics. Um, it is a tragedy for their family, and I just wish more people who agreed with them could see that they're just statistic. He's just another of the six hundred thousand plus folks, and their tragedy isn't any less. And even though we don't hear about it, um, I wish they could channel this very religious, you know, talk they make about, you know, praying for him and all this stuff, which certainly go for it. I understand that God created the virus too, and that we need to try to take from tragedies like this, which it is, something mm -hmm. 
we've got to get over this. This is a... We, we can't get over it with a vaccine, which he rejected. Right. Right. Just being mean about yeah. him but, but isn't Charlie, helping. You've there's got, a to, line, you got to get through to people. Yeah, right. There's a line of demarcation. If you, if, if you die after contracting the coronavirus, after the vaccine was available to everybody in the United States of America, I'm not saying that's on you, but at the same time, I am saying that you can no longer, like, you, your death is not the same as someone who, who died in July of 2020. Because I agree. Because there was no vaccine. All you could do was hope you did not get it and then hope you survived if you did. They chose to, for whatever reason, to not do it. But then if you add on, like Cardinal Burke, who's on a ventilator uh, as we speak, to start talking about chips in your body and all that nonsense. Well, I mean, what does that what does that say to those that you're saying it to? Because you're especially when you're a leader, you're right, Alvin. You could be leading other people to other their graves. People to create physical scandal, if you yeah. will, to to create a, a, a health related scandal. Um, I can't I can't imagine the depths of misery of somebody who has who has promoted anti vaccine, you know, the, that anti vaccine mindset to now know that their chances of actually succumbing to covid. I, I, I can't imagine that depth of misery. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, um, but it is it is very difficult to 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 be broken hearted by these cases. Well, well the, the sad thing is it isn't like people seem to learn. I mean, you know, I, I remember when, uh, was it Herb Cain who died uh, after yeah. the yes. super yeah. spreader in Oklahoma? And there was no great outpouring of uh, sadness from the Trump people. And now, you know, I'm sure this... Uh, the latest uh, fellow Steve Walsh is it, and I didn't know him. Obviously, right. I, I'm sure his immediate family is, is hurt, but his political that fellows they're they're not saying, oh, maybe we've been mistaken. They're I, still I, out there fighting against this. So, and that's ten, why ten I, seconds, I, right? I think that's critical to call them out about. You know, that's a different issue. To me, the people that ought to be called out, rather than saying, eh, too bad you died, I'm more interested in saying, we need to call out. Like, this is this race touches on the Senate race out there. You've got all, this is the big race in Missouri right now. It you does, right? Vicky Hartzler, he was Vicki Hartzler. Good president. point. I'm, I'm sorry they to say. They ought to all be called out. We are out. out of time. That's the, that's the show for the first half, anyway. Thanks, Ray. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. to Donnie Brook next up, Charlie Brennan. I'm Wendy Weiss, and we are thrilled tonight to welcome Maxine Clark to the program, the founder, the beloved founder of Build-A-Bear Workshops. And she has not slow, she's not slowing down, we should say. A wrong turn led her to do something even perhaps more exciting if that's possible, then all of the good work that she's already done. Maxine, welcome to Donnybrook Next Up. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you, can you share with our viewers how that wrong turn while you were going through uh, the, the Del Mar West neighborhood got you to thinking once you passed the old St. Luke's, uh, the, the old St. Luke's um, hospital. Hospital. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, I don't think it was a wrong turn. Just one day, I was. we were working on opening up our KIPP charter school in that neighborhood. On It was on Maple and, and uh, Arcade. And I just, just was going home. It was about 4 o'clock. And I, was, I turned right instead of normally going left on Goodfellow. I decided to go the other way. And I came around the corner on Belt towards Del Mar. And they were nailing the for sale sign, a huge sign in to this hospital. I thought, oh, my gosh. What are they going to do with this? It's so big. I did not really know how big, but I could see it was big. And 
what are they going to do? And I picked up the phone and I called Dennis Lauer at, Co at Cortex and I said, Dennis, why don't you buy this and turn it into Cortex West? He said, oh, I can't do it. We've got so much property. We're so busy. Why don't you do it? And that's usually the trigger, you know, that says, yeah, why don't I do it? I love the neighborhood. I'd met so many people um, through opening up the KIPP school, so many neighbors. And I talked to them about it and they all thought, we can't let this place fall apart, which is what would be likely have been to happen to it because it was quite a large structure. And it was not fully occupied even when they finally sold it and closed it down. So it was, I think it was actually a good turn. You know, sometimes you just, you know, it's the way the journey goes in life. Uh, and I think it was meant to be. Um, and I, from there, I took it further. I went to different partners to see what, because I, I am not a developer, even though I've opened up hundreds of stores and malls around the world. It's a lot different. Um, in fact, I opened up, I had the idea for Build-A-Bear and opened the first store in nine months. This has been five and a half years, almost six years. And before we open, it will be six years. It's much more complicated, uh, but not because people weren't cooperative, just because the processes are complicated. So when you wonder why a neighborhood has fallen apart um, and how long it takes to bring it together, it's because it, they've made it ultra complicated uh, to, to, do, to do the right thing. Well, I know it's called the Del Mar Divine. I know it's significantly north of Del Mar. You can get into that. But tell us precisely where this is and what it will include when it opens. Well, you know, growing up in, um, outside of St. Louis, I didn't know anything about the Del Mar Divide. Every city has a place like this, though, um, sort of a demarcation that separates rich and poor, black and white, or in Miami, it was Hispanics and non-Hispanics where I grew up. Um, it was just really uh, not that unusual, but I had never really paid much attention to it until Ferguson when they started uh, talking about it on the news. Because I was on Del Mar all the time, working in in neighborhoods and in, in public schools north of Del Mar all the time. And it didn't seem like a divide to me. It just seemed unfortunate. Um, I probably had paid attention to it. I would have seen it. But um, what I thought really was what we were lacking was investment, innovation, and inclusion. And so that's what, the, when I changed the D to the N, it was meant to be a temporary name, actually. Um, I was going to come up with something sexier, but I just started with that. And everyone liked it and started calling it and referring to it. So it became sort of the brand name. So I decided uh, to keep it. It's just really meant to change that vision that we have about Del Mar from being a divide to being something that actually gets blurred over time and becomes what it once was, was a thriving um, intercultural, multicultural uh, immigrant neighborhood actually at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Um, I've done so much research on it now. I feel like I know everybody that was ever born here um, because uh, it was a cross section of the St. Louis population, uh, famous and not so famous, um, but so many people have told me I was born there, or my mother was a nurse there, or my father was a doctor, or my mother was a, a, the head of uh, human resources. Everyone has a connection to St. Luke's, it seems. And if I could just jump in here, it, it's going to include apartments and a, like a con. con yeah. A, so it's a bunch a big, of not-for-profits, and yeah. it'll be how, how far east of Skinker will you be? It's between, um, actually between DeBolivar and Union, so okay. it's closer to Union. Um, so it's in the middle between Skinker and Union. Um, and yes, it's a multi, it's a huge campus. It's about 500,000 square feet, about eight buildings that were built from 1904 to 1962 or three was the last building. So a long time. And one of the two of the buildings that were the doctor's offices are going to be offices for nonprofits. Think Cortex for nonprofits, but on a smaller footprint. Uh, the front, the modern hospital, which was actually built in 1961, so not so modern anymore, is going to be apartments, 150 apartments for affordable workforce housing for teachers, nurses, social workers, public health, public safety, those young diverse professionals that make that 35 to 55,000. And, and actually Bill's daughter was is a, a teacher uh, or was a teacher. And I met her, um, I realized how hard it was for young teachers who came into St. Louis or any city uh, to find a great place to live and be a, on a teacher's salary. So that became a vision for me a long time ago. And this, we were able to incorporate that here. And we'll also have retail on the main floor of the of the old hospital new apartment buildings we're going to have a bank st louis community credit union 
We're going to have a pharmacy, the first black led pharmacy in St. Louis for a long time, uh, greater health and wellness pharmacy and a whole new way to think about a pharmacy, a privately owned pharmacy. And then um, we're going to have a restaurant, which we haven't yet announced. And we're going to have a, an investment office, one that's pretty famous in St. Louis, but we've never had an investment office on this side of Del Mar, um, anywhere close to this neighborhood for a long time. So I think the idea is really to encourage the entrepreneurial spirit, encourage per personal prosperity, as well as neighborhood prosperity. Uh, but these nonprofits are um, part of the, the safety net of St. Louis in many ways. Cross section, about a third are education, a third are healthcare and mental health care, and a third are community development. And we've been working with them for about five years. I mean, we've some have come and gone because they had to find a place to live before we were ready to open. But for the most part, we've been working on this mix of tenants for quite a long time. Before we get to how important it is to coordinate all of those nonprofits, and, and it's kind of surprising that it hasn't been hasn't been attempted before this point. Um, we hear so much about food deserts in, in that particular area of, of St. Louis. Will there be uh, grocery stores included in, in, in this Maxine for these families? Well, first of all, we do have a new grocery store that opened up on Union and um, uh, Page. Uh, in um, last year, or maybe it was even, I've lost track of the time, but a save a lot opened up and that's done very well. And then in the new, there's two new apartment buildings on DeBoliver, which is really a block away from us, um, a, a big block. These are big city blocks here in the city of St. Louis, but a block away from us will be, uh, from what I understand, although it hasn't been announced yet on the main floor of one of those apartment complexes, a local uh, grocery store that we're very excited about. So um, they have a bigger footprint for retail than we do. And so that'll be a perfect place. And they have the parking, which you need for a grocery store. So it's really close and um, we're excited about that. But in this neighborhood, in all of our research, in the around 1940-ish, in the 30s and 40s, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 meat markets, delis, restaurants from um, Martin Luther King, which was called Easton, to uh, Del Mar, it was filled with restaurants and food, which really does bring people across neighborhoods. And you know, people tell me, oh, we used to go to the Velvet Freeze. Which one? Because there was one on Del Mar and there's one on De Bolivar. They went to Garavelli's, they went to uh, this coffee shop or that coffee shop. So always food is in the stories that people tell us. And we wanna bring food back to this part of town, like uh, dining. So we're going to have a restaurant. We're gonna have, we, we know that other restaurants will be attracted to this part of Del Mar. There really aren't any between, um, not very many between um, Wabash Station and, and here. Well, I know that you're, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Charlie. Could you could you go back though to how important it is to connect all of these nonprofits in this cortex-like setting? Sorry about that, Charlie. Yeah, no, that's a great question because one of the things that St. Louis is known for, unfortunately, is our fragmentation. It, it permeates everything that we do, and and we have a thousands and thousands of nonprofits, thousands. We, we, we need thousands, but we don't need as many thousands as we have. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 16,000 reported nonprofits. Um, and we can't put all of them in any one building in St. Louis. You couldn't put them anywhere, but we do want to bring people together. And so many of our tenants work with multiple nonprofits. So like Generate Health works with at least 100 nonprofits themselves, and they'll be bringing those tenants to and from the building, working on projects to make St. Louis a better place. So I do think that Cortex was a great model for us to see how when you bring people together and have meeting spaces for people and engagement spaces for people that you can solve problems. I mean, I think we've done uh, we've moved hugely in entrepreneurship and technology and life sciences in St. Louis because of Cortex and T-Rex. Well, we just had never had done it for nonprofits and now we are. There is a, a larger project in Memphis called um, Crosstown Concourse, but it's a combination of, of what we're doing and what Cortex is. It was a former Sears warehouse and it's been converted into an entertainment district, similar location, it's to Rhodes College and we're really near WashU. Um, as you know, Cortex is near SLU. So it really is a, a huge opportunity. We're between the Loop and the Central West End, WashU undergrad and medical school campus, the Forest Park. This is Hollywood and Vine in St. Louis. It's, <laughs> it's surprising to me that it hasn't been developed before this project. Well, um, you of course have great experience in retail with made apartment stores. Uh, you were the president of Payless. Uh, you were involved with Learner and venture and of course the founder and chairman of build a bear 
any possible, I mean, I know retail is kind of a big question mark in 2021, but any possibility of retail on Del Mar? I think there is a possibility. I think you'll start to see small shops uh, coming back. Um, uh, we have obviously the, the Craft Alliance moved from University City uh, down to the city lines over in the project that Jim McKelvey has developed over by uh, MADE on uh, the makerspace there, which is really great. Um, I think you'll start to see it. There's lots of storefronts that we don't own uh, that are on Del Mar between um, uh, Skinker and Union and Skinker and Kings Highway for sure. So I think over time, I think in the next five years, you're going to see a big difference. And I think that small retail um, will be coming back and now they'll have all the technology that big retailers have to not only sell their products locally but also to sell their products globally and i think that's going to make a big difference on what people can count on as their customer following they don't just need foot traffic anymore they can you know open up their business to the world in the opening segment you were talking about the comparison between your history and your work in in retail in, in your professional career. And now as a as a developer, you said they have made it very difficult for because of the process involved. Who are they and what assurances do you have? Because obviously you've done the groundwork, the legwork, the the you you've done the neighborhood archaeology dig, but but what assurances do you have that they will not complicate this process? Well, it's, you know, we're well into construction. All the complicated stuff is behind us. Um, and I have to say the city was incredibly um, uh, collaborative. It wasn't any one person that made it hard. It's just the process that you have to go to through a building that's 100 years old that has all kinds of chemicals in it, that had mortuaries in it, that had buildings that were built at different times. And, you, you know, the engineering of it is just really complicated because the standards for a building today that's going to be occupied by human beings is much different than it was when those buildings were built. And so every time we tear down a wall, we find a new, you know, kind of problem. So it takes a long time to get that right. And we are making it right because we want everybody to live in a place that they're really proud of, but also, of course, that's safe and, and versatile for the next hundred years, not something that we've blocked off or cut corners on. So that was complicated. But my, my partner is Clayco Construction on the development side, and they've just been you know, they know what to do. It's just that we didn't all know what we were getting into at the same time. We found out in different points of time, but, <laughs> but, but really been great partners. And Washington University has been a great partner and U.S. Bank has been a great partner and Midland States Bank has been a great partner. But um, this is a historic building. It was important to me to make it a historic building, to preserve its history um, and to tell the story of this neighborhood for hundreds of years to come because it was a melting pot neighborhood. And we can go back to that again, where lots of people can live in a neighborhood together um, and build prosperity together and have fun and go to concerts and uh, movie theaters and all those. And they're all really in proximity. We don't have to build any infrastructure in the neighborhood. We just have to bring the people. And we'll be having at this time next year in our building alone, probably a thousand people living and working, living and or working. Hmm. And then on those other two projects that are on DeBoliver, just in walking distance, will be another um, probably 400 in each apartment building. So that's really fantastic. And that's people that shop and eat and need dry cleaners and pet daycare centers. All these buildings now, you know, allow pets. There's a really big opportunity for somebody to open up a franchise of one of those pet daycare places. I'm, I'm, I'm touting that because I think we're going to need it. Um, but there's all <laughs> kinds of other things that you need, you know, optometrists, bakeries, ice cream parlors, all possible in this neighborhood. There's space for it. Ma Maxine, you're closer to Bolivar. How important is that uh, trolley or the return of the trolley to your project? Well, it's not really, you know, it's not critical to the project, but I would like to have it because I think it'll keep people um, keeping their cars parked and hop on the trolley to go to lunch in the loop or go to lunch at the park um, or go for a hop down to the park and go for a walk and come back on the trolley. So I, when they, I, I, you know, when they, when I talked to Joe Edwards about it all the way back five years ago, I wasn't sure it was going to happen, but if it did, I thought it would be a, an amenity of the neighborhood that we could, you know, we could use and it comes up to DeBoliver. So it's really just a block away. And I think if it does come back, it will be used. I always thought it would be more likely to be used by neighbors and people that lived in the neighborhood than by tourists um, because, you know, tourists, it's just not a touristy neighborhood. Um, but, but I do believe that people will use it, um, especially the people that live in the apartments around the area, because you can take it to the, you could get on the trolley and go to the metro station, get on the bus and, go, and get on the metro um, uh, train and go downtown to the Cardinals game and come back and 
take it back up. You know, there's just so many opportunities for public transportation to become a bigger um, usage here, right in this neighborhood. Have your bike. You know, there, everything is right here. The Del Mar bus line is right in front of our building. It, it goes by, I think, about every 10 or 15 minutes. It's very, very frequented uh, area. Plus, we're really close to high schools. We have um, Soldan High School, uh, uh, Normandy High School, and University City High School. Kids can come and work in the building. They could come after school. Uh, they could have after school jobs. There's going to be a lot of opportunity um, and access. Access is a really a uh, key word here because I think that that's another reason that many of the things that have are good for St. Louis have not come as soon as we wanted them because they just weren't accessible for everyone. But this neighborhood is highly accessible north and south and east and west. If you're just joining us, welcome to Donnybrook. Next up, our special guest tonight, Maxine Clark, the founder of the Build a Bear Workshop. She is she is now moved. Uh, from the founder of Build-A-Bear to the chief inspirer or co-inspirer, if you will, of building a neighborhood and a way of life and, and revitalizing an important part of this city and the Del, what she's calling uh, the Del Mar Divine. Uh, you have said, you've, you've been quoted in articles, Maxine, is saying that the delays that you mentioned at the outset of this segment have actually been a blessing. How, how have they been a blessing? And, and I know that when you talked about opening up one of your retail stores in a matter of maybe six to nine months, this has to be difficult for somebody like you to make that adjustment. But but why has it worked out as a, as a positive? It's been a really, um, you couldn't have convinced me of this in the beginning if you tried to tell it to me, but the learned uh, life experience is I've gotten to really know the neighborhood really well. And I've engaged with the neighborhood and they've taught me so much about the history of the neighborhood, about what they want for the neighborhood about um, their ideas. And we actually will have in the building a community room that is just for the neighborhood. They'll have access to it. It'll be for meetings. We, we do meetings all over the neighborhood and I hope we'll still do those, but we'll also have a permanent place that our alder person can have meetings. She can have closed door meet, you know, just comfortable, easy access. Um, and I want the neighborhood, the kids to come after school and do their homework, to have tutoring in the building, to have some after school jobs. I think there's really going to be a different flavor. And I wouldn't necessarily have envisioned that from the beginning, but getting to know the neighbors, I want them to be there. I want them to come and be a part of our community, not because they need the services unnecessarily that are in the building, although they may, but really more because it's part of, of their neighborhood. And they part, they help me make it what it is today. You know, um, one of the other things that's been wonderful, I've been invited to, you know, before COVID weddings and baby showers in the neighborhood. I can be in my car in the neighborhood and somebody will call me up and say, I saw you were here. Want to come over for a cup of coffee? That is oh, the God. best feeling. So in a way, this is the same thing I've been doing for the last 25 years is giving hugs. It's just a different kind of hug. <laughs> and I get a lot of hugs back. And I the feeling of this, this is what we should be doing all over St. Louis. There is so much talent, so much knowledge, so many wonderful ideas. And living in this particular neighborhood, the 63112 West End, which is really made up of a conglomeration of different neighborhoods, Skinker de Bolivar, Visitation Park, um, uh, Academy neighborhood, de Bolivar Place, uh, so many neighborhoods. And, and, the, and all the people that I've talked to that have lived here for a long time, they never thought about what was the neighborhood was called. They just walked across the street to the Velvet Freeze or to the grocery store, Mall's Grocery Store, which was a famous, like a giant Straub's, was um, at the corner of Del Mar and where Del Mar and De Bolivar meet, which is now a park between People's Health Clinic and their uh, mm -hmm. Children's Mental Health Clinic. That was a big grocery store, the big clock tower. Um, so we're going to, re we've recovered a lot of these pictures and we're going to make sure that those are in the building. So people, young people and new people that come to the community can see what we really are building on, which is a history of um, great community and beautiful buildings. Uh, and, you know, th all the bad history is there too, what, what the mistakes we made in St. Louis about uh, segregation and red lighting. But I think the bigger challenge to this neighborhood was commerce, the opening up of malls and shopping centers and highways of, after the war uh, in the 50s and 60s that brought people out west. And then all those shops that were on these main streets, the, the, they didn't need them anymore because they could go to the mall and find them. Or the grocery stores, the big schnooks and deerbergs that they started building up. People didn't need the little corner grocery store anymore. And there were a lot of them. But how yeah. ironic is this, Maxine, that now the malls are kind of falling by the wayside and the Del Mar Divine will emphasize the smaller business owner, the shopkeeper. I'm sorry, that's just rich with irony. 
It is, but I don't think that the malls are going away either. I think that we just now have room to see possibilities differently. We have an appreciation, many of us do, for the history of St. Louis and what's possible here and, and not letting it all get torn down. So much of it has been torn down, but also to make sure that those things like the mall doesn't go away. There's lots of uses for some of those big spaces in the mall. I hope they don't ever go away. I'm, I'm a I love to shop, um, and of they'll course, never, they'll never go away. I don't think they'll go away. I, I think that we just have a lot of them, and that they'll they'll be repurposed into w that we've learned our lesson not to let them fall apart, but to just repurpose them, like Chesterfield's being repurposed and other other malls around the area. So I think we have learned our lesson on that. I'm hopeful, um, but I'm especially excited about our our city neighborhoods that we have. And um, there's a group of us, uh, although we're not connected technically. Uh, the Del Mar district, it's called, and there's businesses you know, across Del Mar all the way to um, Vandevenor. Uh, and so there's different developers working on it. And we all meet you know, quarterly. We know what each other's doing. We'll send people to each other. I think you're going to look down Del Mar from, from Skinker, if you can see that far, and you will see a different skyline in five years that you won't, you won't believe. You'll say, what took us so long? What, why, did uh, we not, why didn't this happen? Why did we sooner? wait? A little, a little something about you. Uh, you're not a St. Louis native, but you've been here long enough to maybe qualify. Uh, you studied, I think, journalism at the University of Georgia. How about them dogs? Yes. And um, your mom was, uh, she, she worked for Eleanor Roosevelt, right. correct? Right, that's correct. Yeah, my mother was um, uh, her personal traveling secretary. So she would uh, travel, only worked when she traveled, but fortunately, Eleanor Roosevelt traveled a lot. And my mother was... Um, Definitely, Eleanor Roosevelt taught all the women that worked for her about the underprivileged people in our world, especially children that um, were being institutionalized. And so they went to all these institutions. When my mother um, moved to Florida with my dad after the war, uh, she and three of her friends opened up a school for children with Down syndrome, but it wasn't called Down syndrome then, it was called mongoloidism. And all my whole life, I was exposed to differently abled children. Um, and I know that all children, all children, have um, unique talents and they can contribute to society. And I, you know, I, I wanted to be a capitalist, Charlie. My mother would have probably, you know, turned over in her grave if she heard me say that out loud. But I wanted to be a capitalist so I could do the things my mother did that she had to go and ask people for those donations and ask people for the, you know, the money. I wanted to be able to do it because I was successful, because I could give back. And it, she had a huge influence on me. Uh, growing up in Miami, which is a very interesting city with a different kind of um, politics than St. Louis, you know, one gigantic school district, um, lots of multiculturalism, uh, so many opportunities. I was so fortunate. Um, my father was an electrician. Uh, he, he learned his trade in the military, but he was always making things and doing things. And I think that also played a part in my philosophy of life. It can be, it can, can be built. It can be put together. Uh, you can uh, splice it together one way or another. Building is a good, is, is a uh, good example of that. The building. In the time that we have left and, and, this, and the clock is ticking quickly, uh, there, there are always going to be those who use the, the term gentrification. When anything like this happens, uh, you've just mapped out for 25 minutes why this is anything but gentrification. But for anybody who's on the fence, now is your chance. Yeah, um, there's always going to be something. I want the people who have owned their homes for decades to be able to get their value out of their home. So hopefully they can sell it for more than they paid for it, like everybody else hopes to do in their lifetime. But this building particularly was unoccupied when we took it over. There was nobody living there. We didn't displace anybody. And I'm hopeful that, that all of the empty lots and empty homes that are, are still exist in the neighborhood will um, be able to be um, replenished with people, with human beings of all ages and all backgrounds. And our housing, the housing, the apartments in our building are, are very well priced for those, those workforce um, descriptions that I gave you because I want it to stay diverse. I want it to be um, just like some of the other neighborhoods in St. Louis, just like this neighborhood started with working class people. And it'll be up to them to, to decide the kind of neighborhood that they want. It won't be up to me. It'll be up to all the people living there. And I think that um, there are many, many homeowners and there's lots of apartment dwellers. We have a good mix of seniors and young people, but it'll be different. And I think that um, that most of the neighbors tell me, especially the homeowners, they welcome it. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the apartment renters are worried that somebody might sell their apartment building. But I think that... Um, I think we've got a good mix. I think we've got plenty of uh, diverse properties here. We always have. And I think that they will blossom uh, into what they're meant to be and be proportionate, not be 
uh, too high or too low, I think they'll they'll rise to a certain uh, valuation. Maxine, we have about 30 seconds to go. Can you name some of those 501c3s that have already signed leases? And uh, do you need more tenants? We do have a few more spaces, uh, just a few uh, small, you know, not not no small spaces. Usually they're about 2,500 or 3,000 square feet. Uh, we have, um, let's see, Teach for America. We've got Azrin Allergy Foundation, Generate Health, uh, Alive and Well St. Louis, St. Louis Arc, uh, uh, Behavioral Health Resources, which is moving from the county to the city, Charity CFO, Washington University, and BJC will both have offices, important places here in in our in our project. Um, uh, your philanthropy, which is a small philanthropy, IFF, which is a, a, a Illinois financial facilities organization that funds uh, a lot of nonprofit development buildings and things like that in the building. Um, good enough. Uh, good Unfortunately, enough. you, you have uh, too many tenants and too little time on this <laughs> all program. Good, to all good. Them but all. We have room. We have room for others. So. And what do they do? What, what's the website, Maxine? Uh, Del delmardivine.com and they can no. um, write me a note and at info at delmardivine.com and we'll answer it right away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Maxine Clark from uh, Build a Bear and Beyond in your so-called retirement, now <laughs> operating the Delmar Divine. Thanks so much for joining us on Next Up. Good night. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.